Thanks, Annie. Uh, and thank you guys for, for inviting me, for having me. Um, Liz Robinson had an interesting recruiting technique. She sent her husband and a bunch of undergrads to an event, a Middlebury event I was hosting uh, in New York City. Um, and they bought me like a ton of drinks with my own money, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I woke up the next morning with a splitting headache, alone on my couch, fully clothed, and uh, <laughs> a large bar tab, and an email from Annie thanking me for agreeing to be in something called TED. <laughs> I was not there. <laughs> right, she wasn't there, of course. <laughs> Blameless. Um, uh, so uh, w one out of those four things is great, and that's being here. Um, <laughs> and when I, when I saw the, the topic, embracing risk, I thought, OK, this is going to be easy. Um, uh, in business and life, you deal with risk every day. And uh, I'll just talk about some business experiences. Uh, no problem. I'll think about it on the ride up. Uh, then I got another email from Annie. <laughs> and I'm going to read. I'm breaking a TED commandment by, by reading something, but uh, she sent me a further email and it said, risk can be financial, personal, cultural, religious, or physical. We act differently for different types of risks. We may be indifferent to some risks uh, and phobic about others. How do we break these down? Oh, and you've got 18 minutes to break all of those down. <laughs> um, so I'm going to make an attempt at it, a mad dash and sort of uh, go through some of my experiences, uh, how my view on risk has changed, how I've learned. I still have a lot to learn. Um, and I, I started the same, the same way Bart did. Uh, so I'm going to look up risk, you know, Wikipedia, Google it, because um, we don't look in dictionaries anymore, do we? But, uh, and it, all the definitions have to do with the downside, have to do with the, the expected negative outcome. Um, and what I realized is that the way I sort of have changed my view of risk was by looking for the upside and the positive outcome. Um, so I don't want I'm not going to encourage everybody to be reckless, but I, I also don't think you should be riskless either. Um, and uh, I think I'll start with cultural, um, in large part because we started this session with, with cultural, and I think it's for me, it was the learning to embrace cultural risk was the one that opened up the doors to all the others. Um, I grew up in, in Buffalo, New York. Um, I didn't walk 10 miles to school. I didn't have a newspaper as a raincoat. I was lucky. I had a privileged upbringing, and I'm very thankful for it. Uh, I have no complaints. Um, but it was sort of a cloistered, closed upbringing. Um, I didn't know a lot of people from different countries. I think a French exchange program was about as far as it got, and that was a French exchange program with another private school in a town like Buffalo in France. So it uh, wasn't that different. Um, and you know, you thought about people in terms of their race or sex or ethnicity and not much more. You didn't necessarily engage with it. Um, words that nobody would say now are sort of common. People would say them, and it didn't, nobody got disturbed. And believe it or not, when I got to Middlebury, it was the same thing. Uh, I look around this room, it's a million times more diverse than uh, diverse of a school than it was 20 years ago. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I think programs like uh, uh, this program in innovation and creativity are, are a large reason why. You can attract, the school attracts a more diverse crowd. Um, so I got here, and it was the same thing. It was largely sort of white private school um, culture at, at Middlebury. Um, and that was fine. I enjoyed it. it. I loved it. I didn't think about, I didn't think about anything different. Uh, then it came time to graduate. Um, and I knew, I didn't know much, but I knew I didn't want to get a job. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I had to convince my parents uh, uh, to let me do something that didn't involve work. <laughs> so I, uh, well, I think we just heard about Outward Bound. Um, I, uh, I did a Knowles trip in Kenya, um, which I convinced my parents was somehow educational, and they bought it. <laughs> and, uh, and that's where things started to change. Um, 
after the Knowles trip, I decided to stay. I bought an old, uh, an old truck, and I had a cousin that I had never really met growing up who was there uh, living <laughs> and uh, working in the Peace Corps. Um, and he's actually Chinese. That's a long story that would take more than 18 minutes. Um, <laughs> and we made friends with this Maasai warrior, and the three of us were driving around East Africa having sort of adventures. Um, and it was really my cousin Kelvin and I following this guy, Robert. And he was teaching us so many things. Um, but even then, it was, OK, I'm open to another culture, and, and I'm taking a risk. I was taking risks all the time. He taught us how to approach Cape Buffalo on foot and you know, climb trees and do thi all sorts of things. Um, but the turning point was when my cousin and I decided that uh, we needed to show him something different. And there was no way we could fly him to the States. We were just out of college, and uh, plus visas, passports. So we decided that our uh, what we would do is we would take him for sushi in Nairobi. Uh, and it sounds like a bad joke, but you know, <laughs> a Chinese guy, a Jewish guy from Buffalo, and a Maasai warrior go to a sushi bar. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the start of a horrible joke. But it was actually sort of the start of an awakening of uh, taking cultural risks, opening yourself up, and getting others to open up. Um, I mean, since then, I have probably made a fool of myself in over 40 countries, <laughs> taking that risk, you know horrible dancing. Uh, I've butchered Mandarin, Cantonese, French, Swahili. Uh, but getting out there and trying and really opening up to another culture, I think, was, was the first step in me understanding risk. Um, the next one I'll hit on is uh, physical risk. It's pretty basic. It's the first one that we, any of us uh, encounter, right? It's the finger in the socket, the open flame, the hot water. Um, we all know what it was, what it is. I've never been a huge physical risk taker. When I was at Middlebury, I didn't jump off the Falls of Lana. I didn't ski at Tuckerman Javine. Uh, I didn't even ski in the trees at Mad River Glen. I think the most risky physical thing I did was slide down the hill in front of Old Chapel on the um, the trays, <laughs> the serving trays. <laughs> and I guess some people still do it. <laughs> um, I, I just was not a physical risk taker. Go back to Africa again. I was um, a few years after school. I was I boarded a plane in um, Kampala, Uganda, and it was for a short flight to to Nairobi. Um, and the largest human being I've ever had the displeasure of sitting next to on a plane sat next to me. Uh, a professor, a uh, a professor from the University of Uganda, and um, so I'm sort of sitting here like this with my head basically in the window. I don't want to turn towards him because I'll hit flesh, right? It was sort of <laughs> like sitting next to Jabba. Uh, he had two, I've never seen a human being use two seat extensions before. And as I'm sitting there, and we're in the front row, and I'm sort of looking at the, um, the divider, I said, wow, that's, uh, there's a picture of Great Zimbabwe in there, which is um, uh, in Zimbabwe, another country. But I'm on an Air Uganda plane, or Uganda Airways plane, and I'm just sort of looking. Say, well, it must be an old air in Zimbabwe plane. And then I'm looking at the names of the places. Uh, Salisbury, Bulawayo, Rhodesia. Uh, Zimbabwe hadn't been Rhodesia for over 20 years. So I'm sitting on this plane, crushed against the, uh, the window, uh, and I realize that the plane is older than I am. Uh, <laughs> in a place that's not known for aviation safety as it is. We take off into a storm, of course, and it is by far the worst flight I've ever been on, by a mile. Um, people are crying, screaming, vomiting. Uh, the, um, the masks came out. It didn't, the, the, the cabin didn't depressurize, but I just think it was in such bad shape that all the juggling around, they just <laughs> fell out. <laughs> and you could hear the collective sort of cries. And um, my seatmate, um, sort of turned to me, and I think he was probably most upset that there would be no food service because of the <laughs> turbulence. But he turned to me, and uh, he said, why aren't you nervous? And uh, I just sort of turned to him, and it just came out. I said, look, the odds, of a, um, the odds of a Jewish kid from Buffalo dying on an Air Rhodesia, Air Uganda plane between Kampala and Nairobi are so slim that uh, <laughs> I'm just not going to worry about it. 
and it just came out. And I thought about it later when I was thinking about this, this giving this talk. Um, it sort of occurred to me that running the risk is quickly in your head, sort of doing the math at times, uh, and figuring, you know what, what I think is dangerous, actually, probably not that dangerous. The the odds are not stacked against me. Um, personal risk. And this one, I, I can't name any names just to protect the innocent, but um, uh, it's the first kiss, you know, the first time you tell somebody who's not your mother, father, sister, brother that you love them, and you actually mean it. Um, and I sort of, uh, how am I going to address this uh, to this crowd? And so I looked, uh, I started to look, the last couple of weeks I've been looking at the Middlebury campus, the newspaper. And just this week, somebody, and I forgot her name, but gave me the perfect opening because there was a, an article in there about how no one at Middlebury dates. They only hook up. Uh, and <laughs> is that person in the room who wrote that? <laughs> uh, and I thought this was the exact same article that could have been written 20 years ago. Uh, without a doubt, nothing has changed here. It's still a small school. You still have to see that person and somehow avoid them for the next two years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very tough. And I think about what? What was my, uh, if, if I could have at Middlebury, if I'd thought in this way about a mathematical equation for personal risk, it really, it would have been, I think, uh, blood alcohol level multiplied t uh, by the uh, percentage chance of hooking up on a Friday night. <laughs> I mean, that really, it, w it was that simple. You didn't take personal risks. Um, and uh, that changed sort of long after college. Um, all I can do is just encourage everybody to take that risk when you, the first time you really engage another, another person and open up to them, uh, it's the most rewarding thing, uh, without a doubt. Um, financial risk, which is what I sort of initially thought I was invited here to talk about, but, um, pretty basic stuff. We've heard, heard a lot today, probably already, and we'll probably hear more about it. Um, I looked at it like everybody else did. I think there's sort of an equation that everybody thinks about, which is, you know, multiply your percentage of failure times the expected dollar amount of your loss, and that's financial risk. Um, I think using that equation, you can talk yourself out of any opportunity. You can do enough analysis to talk yourself out of any opportunity. Uh, I have a friend in South Africa. Um, his name is Jared. He runs a company called Riscura. Uh, he actually should be here talking today because his whole life is about risk. Um, the first time he, he took me to his offices, uh, it's uh, huge offices, beautiful offices in Cape Town, uh, filled with PhDs as far as you can see. It's like, I uh, can't remember what, what um, Bill Murray movie it is, but there's a scene where it's doctor, 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 doctor. Same thing. Everybody has a PhD. Everybody's called doctor. These, uh, the brain power in that room, and then the room behind it is this frigid air-conditioned uh, room with no windows that's filled with you know, just as much computing power as there is brain power. Um, but what, what Jared does that's so unique and why his company is, has grown in the last 10 years, it's enormous, and why he's compensated, uh, you know, beyond anybody's wildest dreams, uh, he does uh, exactly what um, Ernie suggested with the Emer Emerson quote. Uh, he listens to his inner voice. He doesn't let all the um, data drive the solution. Uh, he lets the data support the solution, support the investment, support the thesis. Um, so I, I think in terms of financial risk, Avoiding the analysis paralysis trap is probably the most important thing. And trust your gut. Uh, there are plenty of, of um, examples of firms that have been data-driven, analysis-driven, that have been major <coughs> failures. Um, but uh, when you read about the best entrepreneurs, it's usually that they're bold and like uh, the Steve Jobs quote we saw earlier, they follow their dreams. Um, that leaves religious risk which is one I couldn't really get my hands around, and I think I'm still working on it, and I probably will be till about <laughs> 10 years after I die, because then I'll know. <laughs> um, 
but it's probably just sort of having faith, faith in something that you can't see, touch, smell, something that there is no data for, something you can't analyze. Um, I think it's, an imp it's important. I'm not sure I'm there yet, uh, but hopefully someday I will get there. Um, but I'll leave you with a thought that's sort of related. The other night I was at a, a benefit honoring um, a guy called Seth Carmen, who's probably one of the greatest uh, value investors of our generation, right? Somebody who knows how to find opportunities and, and, and deal with risk. And he talked about a discussion he had had with his rabbi uh, that uh, his rabbi told him, you know, Seth, you get a lot of gifts in life, health, wealth, uh, you know, good looks, whatever, th whatever those gifts are. But no matter how hard you try, you're going to have to give those gifts back at some point. And I thought that was really profound. And when I thought about risk, I thought sort of the corollary to that is that uh, you make a lot of mistakes in life. You embarrass yourself. You might break a leg, uh, miss an opportunity. Um, but the good part is, at some point, you get to give them all back. It doesn't matter. So um, I just encourage everybody to look at risk differently, not worry about the downside, and uh, focus on the upside. Thank you.